Uh, good evening and uh, welcome to this lecture on India's ancient architecture and sacred geometry. So it's a bit of an intriguing title, but I think you will realize what I mean as we progress. Um, I would just before I start, I'd like to remind you that uh, there are two more lectures this week. One is on Thursday and the other on Friday. So Thursday will be about Ayodhya and the chronology of Ayodhya as far back in the past as we can trace it. Uh, we're stopping at the somewhere in the beginning of the 20th century to avoid uh, very recent events. Uh, this will be on Thursday and on Friday we will have a look at educational systems in ancient India. How, wh what kind of education was there and how did it work and what kind of evidence do we have? So let me start with uh, this beautiful uh, temple uh, which we will visit briefly during the course of the talk and uh, some of you would have recognized the Kailash temple at Elora which is actually unique in India and you see the, these, I don't know, unfortunately the contrast is not very good but this is a tourist here, you see this little white dot, gives you the scale it's just colossal and uh, what is unique about this temple of course it, it does exist on smaller scales from a technological point of view is that this is not a construction this is a sculpture the whole hillside has been sculpted and what remains is this you know so 100,000 tons approximately of rock was removed chipped away by generations of sculptors and, uh, and the, the size is just uh, awe inspiring so uh, we will revisit it briefly, um, but let me start at the beginning. So once again, we're back to the Indus civilization, and uh, because I'm trying to find some patterns in in India's architecture, patterns of geometry and certain concepts which we'll come to, uh, there is something strange going on, unexpected in the Indus civilization. Completely unexpected because it is what archaeologists call a non-utilitarian feature. It serves no practical purpose whatsoever, and this is the feature that uh, precise proportions are imposed on areas of the city. This is the Acropolis, the upper city of Monjodaro, and it's exactly twice as long as it is wide, approximately uh, 400 meters by 200 meters. And um, well, archaeologists, you know, in vogue, and plus, plus, plus the fact that this is exact north south axis. So there is a desire to align the city to the cardinal directions, uh, which you know is not the case of many. I don't know whether Kampu today is aligned to the cardinal directions. I doubt. Uh, but um, and then there there is a sense of order, and what exactly does it consist in? We'll we'll have a look, and this order actually is attached to the notion of authority in the sense that Harappan civilization do not come up, does not come up with impressive palaces for the rulers as you have in Egypt for example where the palace stands out in many ancient Egyptian cities so you know that the, the pharaoh must have lived there because you know the, the message of architecture is clear here there is no such clear message rather it is this sense of order which seems to indicate and this is uh, especially the upper city of Manjodaro where the rulers definitely must have lived somewhere in one of these buildings but when you look at all these buildings one by one this is what happens every one of those major structures so whether it is the great bath famous great bath I'm not showing you the, all the structures photographically in detail because it would take us too far uh, there's a huge complex of rooms uh, which measures 23 meters by 69 so that w that is exactly a proportion of three to one granary so-called granary uh, there's there are some doubts nowadays whether it was actually a granary proportions are exactly three to two we find seven to five we find seven to six uh, etc and uh, it is very strange because in fact it doesn't seem to have any particular practical purpose so why choose always certain simple fractions simple ratios to to be implemented on the ground which actually complicates the job of the arch architect and the job of the builder so let us proceed uh, then this is in the lower town of Manjodaro 
we find a building where the ratio, the proportions, uh, uh, are almost exactly 1.25, that is to say 5 to 4. And uh, you are going to find this 5 to 4 in a lot of unexpected places, as you will see. This is the largest building in the entire Harappan civilization. Measures a little over 50 meters by a little over 40, so it's huge. And uh, the beauty is that, once again, nobody really knows what it was used for. What function was it? It was earlier called a granary. Uh, but there have been more recent suggestions that it might have been some kind of an assembly hall where people were meeting. But basically, we don't know. But what we do know is that if you calculate the dimensions, you get, again, 1.25. So something is going on. And what is it? We'll explore. This is Kalimangan in Rajasthan, on the edge of the, on the bank of the Gagar or Saraswati River, right on the bank. And it has, like Mohanjo-daro, it has, and, and like several other Harappan cities, it has an upper city here, proportions one to two, like at Mohanjo-daro, the same, and the lower town, proportions two to three. So what exactly is the idea is what we have to try to understand. This is Lothal near Ahmedabad. It's, an, it's a, of course, an artistic re recreation of the site, which certainly uh, must have looked very different, but it's an approximation. And here, when you look at the plan and you take the middle point here, you find 5 to 4 again. If you take this middle point, of course, this side is slanted. You have to take the center for this. And this is the famous dockyard, which you can see here again, and the proportions are exactly 6 to 1. So it looks as if these people did not believe in constructing structures just randomly and let them, you know, uh, uh, let them be whatever they, they might be. They impose certain proportions. And the most uh, extraordinary example is Dholavira, which I've referred to several times earlier. It's a, a large city, for those who might not have followed, a large city in the run of Kutch, in on, on a small island in what is today a very arid uh, region where there is no city nowadays, no town, no big village either, just hamlets scattered on this island. And, um, and here you find that uh, the, the, the city has made basically three divisions, not two as earlier, but three. This is the upper city here, consisting of two structures, which the archaeologist uh, Dr. Ares Bisht, he gave certain names, which are you know, uh, just uh, slightly arbitrary. Uh, but this is the bailey, this is the castle because of the uh, very thick fortifications reaching up to 19 meters in, in thickness, you know, the, the, those walls. Then you have a ceremonial ground, you have a middle town where most inhabitants might have lived, some also in this corner of the lower town, and you have the complete enclosure, which represents an area of 48 hectares. But if you look at the dimensions of the castle, they are exact, very, very precisely 5 to 4, both inside and outside, inner and outer dimensions. If you look at the overall city, then, the, the, then, then all doubts vanish because over a length of what is 771 meters and an irregular terrain in addition, you have a ratio of 5 to 4, almost perfect. The margin of error is 0.01 percent, something like that. So this is clearly a deliberate intention, especially the repetition of that. Then you have two ratios of 9 to 4. This width of the castle to the width of the middle town, ratio 9 to 4, that is 225. And from here also to here, 9 to 4. Something is going on. And uh, this is the ceremonial ground, exactly 6 to 1, which is the ratio of the dockyard at Lothal, as we saw. And uh, 7 to 6 is the proportion of the middle, overall middle town. And there are many more. In fact, uh, uh, these are some of, uh, some of them. Uh, with, you see here the margins of error. The average margin of error is actually 0.6%, less than 1% when you take the measurements. So there is an intention. And in fact, it goes on, because if you look at now the reservoirs, uh, you might remember that Dolavira was sustainable in the third millennium BC only because the, the Harappans there had built enormous uh, systems of reservoirs which were interconnected. I'll briefly touch upon this in a future talk. 
And this largest reservoir, which measures actually 73 meters in length, 73 meters, the ratio is 5 to 2. So 2.5, and very precisely. So there is, of course, a, a, a desire to implement those ratios. 7 to 2, this is the famous rock cut. This is cut in the rock, in the sheer rock. Uh, 7 to 2 for the major reservoir, 11 to 4 for the secondary reservoir at the bottom, and so on. It goes on, but if you plot, this is a, a, a sketch I prepared where I, I took all simple fractions, simple in the sense, of course, mathematically you can always find a fraction anywhere if you, if you want, but they may not be simple, they may be 115 by 37 or something. You will have to, you know, look for the very si all simple fractions systematically, and you find that every one of them there is a Harappan structure somewhere in, in one of the s settlements, uh, the some of, uh, uh, far away, which will take it. So there is an intention, and uh, clearly they are trying to tell us something. Let us leave the Harappan world for a while and go to the Vedas. And some of the late Vedic literature, like the Brahmanas, uh, actually contain certain interesting concepts which is one of, one of which is the addition of a fraction to, a, to the unit. So unit is one, and then you add something. And uh, the procedure is described, and I'll give a later example. Uh, for example, we are told that you know, one fourth can be added to one, so that gives us five fourths, but you can also add one plus one plus five fourths, so we get the nine fourths we are getting at Dolavira. And this addition of, of the, the unity is something which is expressed in many ways. For example, 21 is said to be the number symbolizing the human body. Why? Well, because we have 20 fingers. Now, 20 fingers, but why the one? Because the one stands for the body itself. So you have the 20 fingers plus the body itself, that is the unit. And this gives you the, the, the totality. Seven is the number for space. Why? Because you have four cardinal directions, then you have the direction above, direction below. So that is six, plus space itself, the unit. So, so that makes seven. So this is the kind of, of hints we get in the Vedic literature and the fact that uh, uh, there is an insistence on repeating certain fractions, certain motifs like one plus one four, one plus one plus one four, etc. So this is known technically as recursion and we are going to see it shortly in classical Indian architecture. But before I move to that, I want to show you this surprising um, uh, quotation uh, by Varaha Mihra, who lived in the 6th century uh, AD. And in his Brihat Samhita, which is a kind of encyclopedia of those times, uh, there are some chapters on architecture, and there he lays down precise proportions to be followed. Now why? Because now we have a text, we have literature that explains to us the, Arab, the Harappans are mute. They don't, uh, they don't explain anything to us. But Varahamira says that these are auspicious proportions. So if you apply those ratios to your buildings, structures, you will have an auspicious uh, uh, result. For example, he says, the length of a king's palace is greater than the breadth by, by a quarter. Now formulate that mathematically and you get the 5 to 4 that we have seen for the castle at Dholavira. And he says here the king's palace. So it's, it's quite uh, interesting. Then he says the length of the house of a commander-in-chief, the Senapati, uh, exceeds the width by one-sixth. So one plus one-sixth is of course seven-sixths, which was the proportions of the middle town in Dholavira. There seems to be a continuity. And in fact, I have prepared in some papers much more evidence. But let me uh, just give you one example. If you take a classic text of Hindu architecture, like the Manasara. Manasara is a text uh, evolved in South India, but based basically in North Indian canons. It dates something like 11th, 12th century uh, AD, when a lot of such technical texts were uh, redacted. And you see how it explains. He says the length of the mansion to be built, if you want to build a house, a big house, this is what you do. You should be ascertained by commencing with its breadth and then you increase, you create a length which is equal to the breadth plus a fraction of it. So the unit, again this is the Vedic pattern, the unit plus a fraction of the unit. So it says you can increase by one fourth, that of course gives us five to four, by one half, 3 by 2, by 3 fourths, 
or you can make it twice, or you can make it greater than twice by one fourth. We are getting our nine by four. You can uh, add one half or three fourths, and finally you can make it three times. And if you take all these proportions except this seven to four, which I could not trace at Dolavira, but it is available at other Harappan sites, not at Dolavira. But at Dolavira, all the other fractions mentioned here are available. So there seems to be, I'm not saying of course that um, the, the Dolaviran architects or town planners were, uh, you know, already had already evolved such an elaborate uh, concept of architecture. No, of course not. This is much, much later. There's a difference of uh, uh, something like uh, 3,500 years between the two, between the top and the bottom. But there seems to be a similarity in the concept because otherwise why should we be getting all these fractions so systematically in, in a single city? If you look at the Vedic sacrifice, and we will come back to the Vedic sacrifice in a few minutes, um, <clears throat> this is in fact the original Mahavedi, that is to say the sacrificial ground where the fire sacrifice is going to take place actually at, at this altar here which symbolizes the earth. See, it's, it's round and the husband, wife and priest are going to sit, all three of them, around this altar. Then there's another altar here which symbolizes the sky, the heavens. It is square because of the four cardinal uh, uh, points. And this is the in-between altar, Antaravedi. Antaravedi is the, what is in between the earth and the sky. So that's the path of the moon and the stars. Anyway, we have a, a, a cosmic background, but this is the entire sacrificial ground where there are many other altars. It's very complicated. But I just want to show you, this is the eastern direction, which is the holiest in uh, uh, ancient India, of course, because of the sunrise. And uh, here you have a certain dimension. I'm expressing it in a certain unit, the uh, Prakrama, which is mentioned in the Shatapata Brahmana. And, um, but then, strangely, we, don't, we start from here, and we might have expected a square or a rectangle. Instead of that, we have a trapezoid. And this trapezoid, to me, symbolizes the increase that this sacrifice is going to create, because the sacrifice is always for a gain, either material gain, if you take it very materially, or a, a spiritual gain, if you take it at another level. So this is what this represents. But look at the proportion. It is 30 by 24 and it's 1.25. So we are getting the same 5 to 4 here again that we have already seen at quite a few places. Anyway, we we'll proceed and we'll come back to, to this uh, 5.24. 5 to 4. Um, then we move in the first millennium BC to a, a class of literature which is called the Shulba Sutras. And the Shulba Sutras are basically the first texts of geometry in India. The date is a bit approximative. Uh, this is uh, roughly the date, 8th to 6th century BC. There are four major authors, uh, Bodhayana, Apashtamba, and uh, two more. And they basically give geometric rules for the construction of altars. They are not exactly as we just saw. Uh, first of all, there's a philosophy behind that, which is quite explicit, that the altar represents the whole universe. They want basically to replicate the original sacrifice uh, uh, of Prajapati, the, the, the god who in the Veda, you know, his, uh, his body becomes the various parts of this universe. And therefore, they, they, they want that any sacrifice should be addressed to the universe. But it's not very convenient at a practical level. So what you do is you shrink the universe to the scale of an altar. So there's an equivalence between macrocosm and uh, microcosm, which is our scale. And the human body, very interestingly, is, uh, we're going to find all this in classical temple architecture in a few minutes, is this, the unit which is the base of all calculations. And a Purusha, at the time of the Shulva Sutras, a Purusha is this unit. This is the Purusha, a, a, a man with his arm um, appraised. Later on in classical India, the Purusha will be limited to this. I mean, that's another topic. And um, so this is basically, uh, the all sacrifice has to repeat the original sacrifice that created this world, this universe. And the philosophy is that all of life is, you know, a yajna, an offering. So uh, scholars have s spoken 
of the ritual origin for this reason of Indian geometry and it is very true that uh, it all started from this desire to construct complex altars like this one uh, in, in a way that follows certain rules. This is the Kurma Chitti, the, the tortoise uh, altar where actually each altar has five layers. So this is the first layer. Why five layers? Because the bottommost layer, don't, don't forget this is the universe, you're actually uh, having the universe in front of you. So the bottommost layer is the earth and the highest layer is the, the heavens and in between there are three intermediary worlds. So we have five layers, each layer has 200 bricks, 1000 bricks to build the altar but they wanted to make it a little complicated. You are not allowed to use the same shapes of bricks from one layer to the next. All the shapes have to change and you can see that it is going to be intricate because you can see that uh, there are here alone six types of bricks. And, um, but then there is a constraint that you can change the shape of your altar but you cannot change its area. Now I'm going to show you a couple of other shapes. For example, where the square is an accepted shape of an altar. The circle, uh, uh, which is called um, uh, Rata, Ch Rata Chakra Chitti, is also an accepted shape. And I'll show you one or two more. And this area has to be seven and a half square purushas. That is to say, this, this unit which I showed you. So this is the, now you can see the complication we are getting into when you want to change from one shape of an altar, say from this one to a circle, all your brick shapes are changing, yet you have to ensure that the total area remains the same. So this is what led to very complex transformation of figures they were uh, uh, expressing geometric procedures, for example, to change uh, a square into a rectangle of si exactly the same area, or a square into a triangle and vice versa, or a square into a square of twice uh, the area and so on. And also, of course, what became, you know, in medieval Europe, the eternal problem of the squaring of the circle and the circulature of the square. That is to say, how do you transform, geometrically speaking, a square into a circle and vice versa. Of course, this one was approximate. It is approximate because pi, pi does not, the nature of pi, which is transcendental, does not allow you to have a perfect geometrical procedure to change a, a square into a circle. Whereas a square into a rectangle, you can have an exact geometric procedure. So this is what Shulba Sutras are about and this is another shape, complex, five, same five layers, 200 bricks each and again every layer, I'm showing you only one, uh, I think this is the bottommost layer, uh, will have different shapes of bricks. So this is really the birth of geometry uh, uh, in India and um, this is going to be amplified upon by all classical um, mathematicians something like a thousand years later, later than the Shulba Sutras. So I just wanted to show you the, the, um, uh, the, the, the concepts behind those altars and uh, we have actually one piece of evidence from Uttarkashi, not uh, very very far from here, in Uttarkhand, uh, where a, a huge altar was excavated at Purola. Uh, this altar measures 24 by 18 meters. It is actually about twice as large as what the Shulba Sutras actually prescribe. So it is not an exact implementation of the Shulba Sutras, but then we can see that this uh, falcon altar uh, was actually constructed uh, uh, at least in a few places. Uh, the ratio of this one, of course, is exactly 4 to 3. So there's always a ratio. There's always some auspicious proportion. Now, this is the background which slowly evolves into, into classical Hindu architecture. I mean, there is, of course, no time to document all the linkages. It's quite a slow and complex evolution because now we are jumping, we are jumping a whole millennium between the Shulba Sutras and the beginning of classical um, uh, Hindu and Buddhist and Jain architecture because the three architectures are basically the same. Uh, there are minor variations, uh, uh, more in, uh, the, in the sculptures, in the decoration, in the, but actually the, the, the basic principles of the architecture are the same with the three religions. So 
We come now to one of the oldest uh, living temples, uh, I mean, just as an illustration, it is 50 kilometers from here at uh, Bhitargaon, and um, uh, this is from the Gupta era. And of course the temple must have been much bigger than this structure, but this is what is left. Most temples in North India uh, have uh, vanished for various reasons. Uh, very few survive, but I'll show you one or two more. Now, the thing which struck British and European Indologists when in the 19th century they started describing this temple and trying to make sense of you know Hindu architecture, Indian architecture, is the fact that there seems to be some uncontrolled uh, you know uh, exuberance, uncontrolled uh, uh, what what some of them actually called chaos. You know that they found that there was no if you compare to uh, let us say the cathedrals. Uh, of uh, Europe, you know, which uh, which are so symmetrical, so orderly, and so on. Here, there's something which disturbed them, and actually, some of them, uh, uh, you know, were very scathing about. Uh, I could have given a quote or two about this this apparent chaos. This is from the Minakshi Temple in South India. Of course, it's an extreme example where every square inch of this Gopuram is uh, sculpted. No space is left free. And, and you have basically you have you, you, you have cosmic scenes like the the churning of the ocean here. This is the uh, you know you can see the rope here, and and uh, no no space is left free. So the question is, of course, this is a caricature because there is still an overall sense of harmony. So how did they manage to instill this sense of harmony? Is what I want to now uh, spend a little time on. And uh, in fact, before I do so, uh, this notion of chaos is actually very explicit in Indian architecture. And this is the chaos. This animal, which is a mythical composite animal called Makara, but it is not just a crocodile. It's a, it has sometimes the head of an elephant or the trunk, uh, 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 feet of uh, various animals, sometimes the, uh, the, the, the tail of a fish. Uh, sometimes tail of a peacock. Anyway, it's a composite animal, and it explicitly in the in the classical text it explicitly means chaos. That is to say, it is the period where the universe is reabsorbed. It has been destroyed. It has been, you know, it is pralaya. It it is pralaya. Actually, this animal symbolizes pralaya, and you have this arch, this uh, beautiful arch, which represents we, at the top of it you have uh, the kirti, the, the crown, kirti mukha, the crown, which represents the, the universe in its created form. So you have a cycle from chaos, pralaya, to creation and back to uh, chaos. So the, actually the, the uh, cl classical Indian architects were very conscious of this notion of chaos and they were looking for ways to impart some order in this chaos. Now there were many ways and I'm going to uh, uh, detail a few. One as far as the statues are concerned is the science known as iconometry. Iconometry, that is to say the measurements of icons, of images, is a very elaborate uh, technical field and there are texts and texts about that which uh, prescribe how images of particular gods. So you have the, uh, the, the major gods, for example, they may have uh, 120 angula. Angula is a unit uh, which is at the base of all these measurements. Uh, sometimes in ancient India it was said to be the width of the middle finger, but sometimes it evolves into the length of this phalanx. And, um, and then there is the hand span. So the hand span is this, it is called uh, Vitasti in, in Sanskrit. Uh, this is the hand span and it is actually 12 angulas. You can, you can measure with your own dimensions, you will find that it, it, it fits. So this is the basic unit which all statues use. And depending on whether you're dealing with a major god, minor god, male, female, it becomes very intricate, uh, you will have various uh, um, dimensions dictated, dimensions and proportions. So, uh, for example, here this is the typical uh, way the body is divided in uh, classical uh, Indian sculpture. Seven and a half um, vitasti, 
uh, you can multiply by 12 to get the number of angulas, and this represents the whole human body. Uh, this is called talamana. Now, tala is a term we are used to in classical Indian music. You know, in Hindustani music, what is tala? It is the, the, the rhythm, the beat. But there is also a rhythm and a beat here in statues also, though we may not perceive it if, you know, if we look at them in an untrained manner. We don't pay attention, but this is extremely rigorous in, uh, uh, in, in all these temple uh, sculptures. Now, there are other concepts at work when we look at the monuments themselves. One is that actually there are two major symbolisms at work. One is vertical and the other is horizontal, as, as I call them. This is my own terminology, in fact. And the vertical uh, symbolism, you can see it here at uh, Prambanam, which uh, we visited earlier uh, in Indonesia. This is one very large complex of uh, Hindu temples. Uh, uh, one is for Shiva, Brahma and Vishnu. Uh, this one is Shiva. And uh, it gives us a good model to understand the vertical symbolism. What's going on here is that you have a certain foundation. You see, this is it. And actually, the entire, the entire temple is assimilated to a cosmic human being, a, a Mahapurusha, or sometimes, as you will see, uh, he is called Vastu Purusha also. And this cosmic being is, is actually what the temple stands for. So uh, it's, it's actually pattern on the human body. The temple is pattern on the human body, but it is also a symbol for the cosmic being, so for the universe in other words. So we have all these equivalences at work. So you have here the feet of this cosmic body. Then up to the top of the Garbhagriha, you have the main body, and this is the head or the shikhar of the, um, uh, the, of, of the temple and of this cosmic being. But in addition, there is a cosmic equivalence where the feet are equated to the earth and the body is equated to Bhuva Loka, which is the intermediary world, whereas the head is uh, equated to Swar, Swar Loka, or the heavens. So, in other words, vertically speaking, the temple is again a miniature representation of the universe, because you have all those three worlds. This, of course, is borrowed from the philosophy of the Shulba Sutras a thousand years earlier, and it is also pattern on a human body. So, we have many equivalences at work. Then there is what I call the horizontal symbolism, and I'm taking the example of the Brihadishwa, or big temple of uh, Tanjavu, magnificent uh, Chola temple, which uh, <coughs> recently celebrated uh, its uh, thousand year anniversary. Uh, that was two, three years ago, built by Raja Raja Chola. Now, if you look at the plan, this is actually a very good example of the various components. I'm not going into intricate details about um, you know the different styles this is the so-called Dravidian or South Indian style of temple architecture in the north uh, we'll see a few examples things are a bit different but basically the concepts are the same you have you have a total enclosure and there is some kind of a gopura which in North India is often much more modest generally much more modest and uh, uh, it, it bears different names. Um, uh, in fact, it uh, often bears the name of uh, Tohana, which is borrowed from Buddhist architecture. And then you have various uh, mandapams, various areas where, for example, in this one, there is Nandi facing the, the, the great Linga, exactly in the alignment. Uh, then you have two mandapa, actually, which are holes where a lot of activities are allowed, such as, you know, religious discourses, dances, uh, uh, all, all kinds of cultural activities, music, of course, uh, performing arts, basically. And then, as you continue this travel, as you continue this travel, you come to an antechamber to the Garbhagriha. This is called Antarana, of course. That means, basically, in between. 
So this is usually very small, but in some temples it happens to be larger. And then you have the Garbhagriha, or the, the, the Sanctum Sanctorum, above which the Shikhar, which in South India is called Vimana, is located, of, I mean, is erected. So <clears throat> this is the basic uh, uh, sketch, but you can see that there's a tremendous amount of geometry at work. Because look at all these circles, how all these structures are inscribed in certain circles. You see the, the, the edge of the, uh, the square, for example, coincides with this circle. And here, this division between the two mandapa is another circle that will coincide with this alignment of this minor temple, which if I remember well is a temple to uh, Kartikeya, and so on. So there is, and then of course, this major division between two squares. You see, so one plus one, this is two by one basically. And the diagonals always point to either the Garbhagriha here or the Nandi image there. So there's a lot of planning, thinking uh, of a geometric nature to, to put order basically in this structure, to, to, st to structure it, to order it, and to give it rhythm. Now when you visit at ground level, you don't see all this, of course. You're not aware of all this, but this is supposed to be, nevertheless, what the architects must do to, <coughs> you know, embed auspiciousness, and in this case, of course, sacredness in the case of temple architecture, in the uh, structure. Now, if you look at the same, I have now turned this, I have turned this plan 90 degrees, and if you follow the journey from the entrance, which is the Gopuram, this section is, symbolizes the outer world. Up to this point, you're still in the outer world, because anything can take place here. As I said, discourses, cultural activities, sometimes in olden days, educational activities, also teaching used to often take place in temples. Temples were also very often learning centers. But then, then the inner journey is here. It begins at the Antarala and, of course, ends with the Garbhagriha. So what you are doing, basically, when you visit a temple, this is very clear in such, uh, you know, a, a, incidentally, this is one of the very, very few temples in, in South India which was built at one go according to a defined plan. Many, all the other temples which you may visit at Madurai, Rameshwaram, Uh, they are temp m m a little messier when you look at the plan for the simple reason that every dynasty kept, uh, so you had the Cholas and sometimes the Pandyas and sometimes uh, uh, you have the, the Vijayanagar Empire and the, you have the Naik uh, rulers and so on and everyone wants to add some mandapam, some uh, uh, sanctuary you know, to, for, to, to get some glory in future. So, so then that's why you get very uh, complex plans which are not so neat as this one. So this is basically the journey, the horizontal journey, where uh, uh, the vertical is, is something cosmic and the, the horizontal is a journey from our outer being to our inner being symbolized by the Garvagriya. So this is very briefly and uh, maybe from my, I mean, uh, I don't know whether traditional architects would agree, but this is to my perception the Uh, philosophy behind, the main elements of philosophy behind uh, temple architecture. But then there are certain technical devices. And the most, one of the most important, and this is why I call it sacred geometry, is the repetition of a motif. There, there are patterns. And ancient Indians were extremely attentive Uh, to, uh, of, of patterns, you know, they, they wanted patterns to be there always. So the pattern here is that every structure which you see here is actually a miniature temple. So you have, you have the temple itself, this is actually the Virupaksha temple in Hampi. You have the temple, but it is composed of elements and every element is basically equivalent to the whole. So this repetition of a motif is, is a, 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 an impressive device which can be found at many levels. This is the uh, Kandariya uh, Mahadev temple of Khajurao. There are many temples at Khajurao. This is one of the largest. 
And you can see you now this, this same repetition, but in another dimension. You see all of these structures, all of these structures, all of which correspond to some uh, mandapa uh, below, all of these structures are basically nothing but a, a repetition, but increasing repetition, which leads us to the complete uh, shikar, the, 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 the tower above the Garbhagriha. So there is a, a, a kind of amplification which uh, takes place in many ways. This is, this is of course, a uh, sketch to show you. This is the same temple, in fact, seen from profile. And uh, this is what creates a sense of uh, uh, you know, successive dimensions, uh, amplification of this one is from Cambodia. The same principle traveled out of India. Uh, the, 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 this, this is what is known as recursion or repetition of a pattern. It takes other shapes. For example, here you have the, these magnificent corridors at the Rameshwaram temple in uh, South India where you have hundreds, actually thousands of pillars which give you this kind of uh, sense of a rhythm. You see something is happening when you look at it this way. Uh, there is, there is a, 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 a it takes you into another dimension. This is actually the goal. And, but you can also find it outside on the very architecture of the Shikharas in this, for example, ancient temple of Mukteshwa in Bhuvaneshwar, which is 9th century AD. 9th century AD, you have also this constant repetition of a pattern uh, all the way to the top of the Shikara. So these are some of the devices which, which are used. And um, uh, but then there are other things going on which are very interesting and uh, uh, which are the way these plans are actually evolved. And they are evolved through a method, all of these, all of these plans, they are evolved through a method which mathematically is called uh, fractals. What are fractals? Fractals are structures that repeat themselves on any scale. So, for example, you know, a snowflake, if you look at a snowflake and you look at a small segment of the snowflake, you find the same structures which you had detected uh, uh, when you look at the total uh, uh, snowflake. Um, uh, mathematicians use fractals, for example, for uh, coastal areas of, you know, uh, when you draw maps, uh, coastal areas often have fractal designs. So, fractals exist in nature. But of course they are not mathematical in, in the full sense because they have to stop somewhere. You can't go all the way to the, the atom or all the way to the universe. Uh, in mathematics there is no such limit. But then there have been several studies of fractals in uh, uh, Hindu temples. Uh, this is one of them which interestingly has been made by three Koreans. Uh, um, but there are several more, a uh, few by Indians, where actually you start from a basic simple structure and you add a part of it, a part of it is added on both sides. And you keep adding, you keep filling all the gaps with a part of this original structure. And you end up having ultimately stepwise this, uh, which is actually a fractal structure. Uh, and this is actually the top, this is the shikara at the same uh, Kajurao temple seen from top. This is at the end of it what it looks like. But you see how it has been formed from the uh, out of the simple structure, square structure which uh, uh, which represents the center of the Garbhagriha. So this is a, a very elaborate technique. We um, the texts are not explicit on all the procedures of construction and uh, there's a lot of you know oral knowledge which is not put in writing, but uh, some of the texts do allude to this, you know, uh, constant amplification of a particular motif. Uh, this is the same shikara, uh, this is the same shikara, but look at, you see, after the addition of the uh, side, uh, the intermediary structures here. So these are recent studies in fact, and um, uh, you know, it's interesting that uh, we can always look at ancient uh, uh, technologies with fresh eyes. Uh, this is in fact a part of the ceiling. I'm sorry, it's a bit hazy. You may not be able to spot easily this motif, uh, which is reproduced here at the end. But it's the same thing. It starts from one central motif, which is here, 
and you keep building up, just building up, building up in exactly the method of mathematical fractals. So this is what um, many temples use to create a sense of rhythm, to create a sense of uh, 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 you know multiple dimensions, uh, amplification, and so on. There are other important geometrical techniques at work, which are, which is uh, one of them is the technique of the mandala. That is to say, you don't start from just any plan. You are actually right from the beginning. You are placing your initial plan, especially the Garbhagriha, or in this case, the Borobudur stupa, which we visited uh, last week, perhaps, uh, in uh, the largest stupa in the world, uh, which is um, uh, in, in Indonesia. And uh, it's enormous. For those who did not see earlier, I mean, you know, these people give you the scale, or, or these people here give you the scale. So it's enormous, but then it is, somebody did uh, one, uh, somebody called, um, uh, excuse me, here, his name is Mark Long, did a detailed study, a very detailed, meticulous study of this stupa. First of all, he pointed to the same, and I want to show this because it's a Buddhist uh, monument, it is not a Hindu monument, and yet it uses exactly the same cosmic philosophy. You have vertically the foot of this Mahapurusha, the body of it, and the head. So the same symbolism is at work, but in addition here, it is also uh, spread out uh, horizontally, because unlike a Hindu temple, you can't, there is no Garbhagriha, you can't enter a stupa, it is solid, there is nothing you can, uh, so, so here the symbolism is repeated horizontally. But then what he found was that they were very complex mandalas. A mandala is a geometrical figure which can serve all kinds of uh, uh, purposes. Uh, you can use a mandala for pure art, uh, pure paintings. You can use a mandala for, uh, if you want to use, to, to do some black magic. Somebody was asking me earlier about black magic in ancient India. Well, mandalas can support magic if, if, you, if you're so keen. Um, but mandalas are also used in architecture. And they are basically geometric pattern or grids, which you will uh, uh, align your structure into. And then he shows how also this uh, Mark Long, how actually the mandala is patterned also on the dimensions of the human body. So it's very interesting to trace all these connections. Uh, but in the classical uh, Indian temples, Hindu temples, uh, the mandala was not 19 by 19 as it is here. There were basically two mandalas at work, two uh, sets of uh, 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 squares. Uh, one was 8 by 8 and the other was 9 by 9. Actually, in temple architecture, 8 by 8 is the one which is used most of the time. And uh, 9 by 9 is more for uh, domestic structures. Let me just uh, show you uh, some plans of Hindu temples. Uh, these, these are completely from Cambodia. So you can see actually something which is very familiar to us. This is Angkor Wat. This one highly, so highly geometric and it is obviously based on a clearly defined mandala is uh, uh, Nom Bageng. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce correctly, but it is on top of a mountain from which you can see um, uh, uh, Angkor Wat temple, though it was actually built earlier, not after. So you can, you can admire the, the geometric layout. And this one, uh, also in Cambodia, is remarkable for its multiple enclosures. Multiple enclosures uh, is something that, well, we see it at Dholavira and we see it in many, many uh, uh, structures. This is also part of the recursion. You see the, the, the rate, you, you keep iterating and you start from you know, central structure and you keep building further and further enclosures. Uh, now a few plans from India. Um, well, top right is the same Elora Kailash temple I showed you at the start. So it's a little more complicated, but there is a mandala at work for the center, the, the, the central part of it. But it's a bit more complicated because they had to fit, you know, this in the mountain. So there are some irregularities compared to 
the traditional temples. If you look at the one here, this is from Ranakpur. It is a Jain temple. It's a temple to Adinath. And uh, you can see, therefore, that they, they, they follow, again, the same geometric uh, principles as Hindu temples. There's basically no difference. And uh, uh, again, there's a very complex mandala at work, a grid. Uh, and uh, this one is actually the uh, Vishveshwara temple or Vishwanath temple at Varanasi. And this sketch is drawn by James Princep, uh, who was a very famous uh, British Indologist because he's the one who deciphered Brahmi. Before Princep, nobody could read Brahmi inscriptions. Uh, so he's the one who first uh, published the Edicts of Ashoka, for example. And, uh, <coughs> and actually, this is the original Vishwanath temple on which uh, Aurangzeb built uh, his mosque. And he has shown here in dotted lines, he has shown the ex existing contour of the, the mosque. So the mosque is here, but uh, you know he drew the temple. And, and of course, the, man the mandala here is very obvious. We can see three by three. So this is going to be a nine by nine uh, structure, basically. And uh, this is his own sketch, his own sketch of the mosque with the temple beneath. Um, now, when we move to what is supposedly called secular architecture, some, some, this is a technical term which a lot of scholars use. What they mean to, by this is simply non-religious uh, uh, structures which are, do not follow strictly a non-religious uh, uh, purpose. Uh, there, we find that actually a lot of very similar principles are at work. And uh, this is the famous uh, Vastu Purusha. But now this Vastu Purusha is not vertical as, as in the temple. He has been projected on a, you know, the floor, the ground map, the ground uh, plan. And uh, well, there are lots of legends uh, uh, explaining that uh, he's a demon who has been contained in the structure and we must be very careful, you know, not to antagonize him. So for example, uh, in traditional houses, and this is the case, for example, in, uh, in South India, both Tamil Nadu, Kerala, but also parts of uh, North India, uh, you have actually a fairly squarish uh, house with a central veranda. And one of the principles of uh, Vastu, I'm talking about the original Vastu, not what goes by the name of Vastu today, which is very different, or somewhat different. Uh, but in the old Vastu, you should always keep the center free because this, uh, this is the vital center. You see where the vital energy here is. So if you obstruct it, your whole building will be most inauspicious. And then, of course, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be the northeast um, uh, dimension. The head actually is here now. Uh, this is rotated slightly. You can see the head. So northeast is non-edge. Uh, the feet are where you should, you know, in your house. This is uh, southwest where you should keep heavy stuff. Uh, like a storeroom or a master bedroom, uh, whatever is heavy should be at the southwest, south, it's south. So every corner, every segment, in fact, goes to a particular god or goddess uh, with Brahma at the center. So uh, this is, um, and then the ground plan here is nine by one, you can, nine by nine. You can see the nine squares, and every one of the 81 resulting squares is attributed to a particular god or goddess. And there are variations. It's not that this is always like this. Depending on which ancient text you consult, there are variations also between North and South India. So it's not as if it is, you know, s cast in stone or in brick. Uh, uh, in fact, in the course of time, there is an evolution. But no, no ancient text tells you, you know, that you should uh, have your bath facing this direction uh, or um, keep your car in that particular direction. That doesn't. Uh, this is modern Vastu, but uh, it's quite different. I want to show this um, sketch with Professor the late uh, Bala, Professor Bala Subramaniam of IIT Kanpur, uh, made when actually I pointed out to him all these uh, ratios at work in the Harappan world, and he said, "But look, the Delhi Iron Pillar, which he studied so well, as you know, and there's a replica uh, here on the campus." I think it's half size replica. Uh, if you look at the excavated, the, the portion over the ground, this is the ground level, compared to the total length, you get the same five to four. So this is supposedly a secular structure, but this 
ratio comes again. And uh, then, then we can see entire cities, of course few, I showed the other day, some uh, very striking city of uh, Shishupalgar in, uh, near Bhubaneswar with this rigorously square plan. Uh, this is Jaipur. This is Jaipur where we can see the same, uh, the same set of 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 squares except that the hill here, you see this is where you see that Indians are, can always adjust and are always you know, accommodative. The hill was obstructing so this square was actually transferred here which is not rigorously according to the text but never mind this is a, a city which is planned according to Vastu. And um, so it shows you that these principles actually were running across so-called sacred or religious architecture and so-called secular architecture. The, as, as always, the border lines were very ha hazy. I want to draw your attention to the title of Jai Singh. Of course, you know Hindi better than I do. And this means 1.25, right? Sawai means 1.25. And Sawaya, I'm told, is the way you can make offerings in some temple when you offer one point one and a quarter kilo of rice rather than one kilo of rice. So we find the same one point two five. Why why should you know a Maharaja call himself one point two five Jai Singh? <laughs> and uh, the answer is obvious again. This is an auspicious proportion, and he is basically telling us you know that he exceeds his predecessor by, there has to be an increase always, there has to be an increase. So 25% better than his predecessor, which is relatively modest as a claim, but, uh, but uh, you see this is the philosophy which we can trace all the way from, uh, from Harappan proportions. Uh, let me end with uh, uh, something rather different, but which still has to do with embedding uh, some uh, uh, something unusual in a landscape. This is, done, this is a work done, and I, I could give many more examples, but uh, by an uh, uh, American astrophysicist, his name is John McKim Melville, and he has worked a lot in India. He's an expert on what is known as archaeoastronomy. So he studied the ancient astronomy of many ancient uh, uh, civilizations, and you know, again, trying to discern patterns, uh, 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 alignments, and in fact, I didn't have time, but I could have pointed out that many temples follow cardinal directions. Sometimes you have pillar alignments pointing to, for typically the sunrise on 21st June, you know, on the solstice, sometimes the equinox. So uh, there are astronomical concepts embedded in temples that we could have expected. But what is much more unexpected is that in many cities he has explored Hampi, he's ex he explored Chitrakut, uh, he explored two, three more, and he explored Varanasi. And in Varanasi, he found that, the, see, the, this is a, a, a city, of course, dedicated to the worship of the sun, and especially in the form of the uh, 14 Aditya. Adityas are Vedic deities, which are basically solar, solar gods, and uh, he wanted to see how these were distributed on the landscape. And this is something which actually, <coughs> uh, you know, local citizens had never, uh, I mean, modern inhabitants had never bothered about. This was not part of their traditions, not part of what they, they remembered about the city. So they took uh, some two or three weeks to first of all locate all these shrines, because some of them actually are not at all uh, big temples, they are uh, small shrines, and some are really tiny, uh, a small niche embedded in a wall. So it took time, they had to work with a lot of senior uh, pundits, and uh, finally they could map the whole thing. And when they mapped it, they found something astonishing. They found that from one shrine, if you draw lines to all the others, you have exactly, they point to the sunrise every Hindu month, starting from starting from Makar Sankranti here, 14th January. This goes below to uh, 14th December, 14th November, 14th October, and above it moves towards February, March, a April, May, June. So, and it ends at the equinox, you see, uh, uh, 21st June. So there is something, 
there is something, no, rather it ends in 14th July, sorry. Uh, there is something quite astonishing, which is, and, and this is a lost tradition. That's what is very interesting to me. It's because it shows you how sometimes modern investigations can actually rediscover lost traditions. This is something no pundit in Varanasi remembered or knew about. That this whole city was actually designed as a kind of a sundial, if you like. It's a sundial. The whole city is a, is a calendar. The whole map is a calendar. You see, so this is quite astonishing and it is another way, yet another way, of bringing the cosmos into the, the geography, into structures, into, uh, you know, in, into, into uh, basically, in this case, into a whole city. So there is a desire in the ancient uh, Indian, and not just the ancient Indian, you could do a parallel lecture probably looking at ancient Egypt, typically. Uh, there is a desire to be always united to the cosmos in some way. And these are, I have just shown you briefly some of the devices that are used to embed uh, these concepts of cosmology, sacred geometry, sacred ratios. So coming back to the Harappan times, I cannot of course swear that these proportions had a sacred meaning to the Harappans because they don't explain, but obviously they were important because they kept applying them repeatedly, site after site after site. So this is the idea I think I've explained sufficiently, uh, you know, to, to have equi build equivalences between our micro level to the macro level and uh, to the universe. And of course, it's not only auspiciousness, but it's beauty that is a major concern of uh, architectural practices. So this is a very brief uh, uh, overview of Indian uh, architecture from a slightly unusual point of view, where I wanted to show you those, uh, 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 those concepts at work and uh, some of the you know, geometry that goes into the, the building of these very complex uh, structures. Thank you.